Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Brendan said, my name is Claire Tuffy, and I manage Bruna Bonia Visitor Centre on a day to day basis. And this is my friend and neighbour, Tomasa Hushteen. Yeah, it's Misha Tomasa Hushteen, it's Privija, a Munskull, Artul May, Skull Nave Pio Krukaman, Tammy and Shah Nukun Lurch live in Omakri, er always or fe always. At that on a hunger, the Makri, Shishina, Irocked, Agus, Winchin Ammonia, Winchin Abonia, and Lound Abonia. Agus just a raglan and a haglet, the Ahan Rudd, Scree for Agamon Shaw, Go Plower. We called our presentation Good Neighbours because that's what we think we are, and we work very hard at being good neighbours to one another. And um, we've worked together for many years now, almost. 20 years. Yeah, just what, what does uh, the term good neighbours mean? Um, because we are without doubt good neighbours. Good neighbours are there when you need them. They don't impose upon you. They keep a caring eye from a distance. They don't interfere where they shouldn't. Um, and to borrow a phrase used earlier by Neil, we know the boundaries between public and private. All that is done is done for the right reasons. And uh, we reach out wherever we see fit. We don't contact each other on a weekly basis by any means. And uh, Claire here has a, a very can-do attitude and if I need her, she's there, and vice versa. We are good neighbours. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with where we are, um, Brunabonia is one of Ireland's World Heritage Sites. We're situated in County Meath, another Meath representative here today, uh, located between the, her the core of the World Heritage Site is between the, ta the village of Slane and the town of Drogheda. Um, Tomasa School is in the one of is in the buffer zone south of the River Boyne. This uh, illustration here shows the extent of the World Heritage Site. Five thousand years ago, the Neolithic farmers who built the monuments at Bruna Boyne uh, used the area within the bend of the River Boyne as a sacred landscape. The monuments are very well known, internationally significant. Newgrange. Most of you, I hope, have been there. Nowth, which is probably the most impressive prehistoric monument in Ireland. And Douth, which has not yet been excavated in, in modern times, but is still accessible for visitors. Newgrange has been open to the public since 1699. After excavations, the number of visitors who visited the site grew exponentially. Moss. Yeah, um, maybe just if I could come in here and talk to you about how um, my love for the area started and developed. Because when I first cycled out to Douth, Newgrange and Nowth at the brave age of 10 years, um, I went off to explore the caves, as they were called locally. And my first stop, Douth, I was presented with a miner's helmet and quite a heavy lamp and I entered the bowels of the earth after much rummaging with keys and with thanks to a very kind lady called Mrs White and further up the road another lady was just about to lock the door of a wooden hut to bring a group on tour of Newgrange and the wonder and awe experience that this monument is still with me to this day the imagination ran riot in what was definitely um, a sacred place, another world place. I had lots of questions for the guide that day. Um, and there was another group standing at the hut, ready to be brought up to the monument when we returned. I travelled on to Nowth, and I witnessed 
a black polythene covered mouth. It was my last stop, um, and I was a little bit let down by it, but it didn't dampen my enthusiasm. As Claire said, as the, the, the site has grown in popularity, as I grew, the site seemed to grow in popularity. Um, then a young lady on her bike used to cycle out from Navan to man the wooden hut and to guide the tourists up on 150,000 at this stage. And the word of the, the caves, as they were called, was spreading fast. And while the facilities may have been quaint, they were certainly they were inadequate and they, they were not sustainable, non-sustainable. The bigger picture also dictated that the problem of wear and tear on the 5,000-year-old monument or the 5,000-year-old treasure needed to be addressed in a strategic fashion, taking into account the sensitivities of community. So somebody did grab hold of the bigger picture and did start to think about how these sites were to be managed, how the focus would be taken away from the monuments themselves. Um, when I see the 1993 date there, there's still a wow factor about having a UNESCO-listed World Heritage Site on your doorstep. The visitor centre itself opened in 1997. It was to be the fulcrum of a regime to manage such a precious and sacred place being visited by so many people. Just uh, this particular slide here is a painting by a local artist called Raphael Hines. Now, before there was any talk of a visitor centre, um, I'd say possibly before there was any talk about um, taking the focus away from the monuments, I commissioned a painting um, by Raphael of Newgrange, which was so close to my heart. And Raphael was always very turgid and thorough in his preparation, and he went around the Boyne Valley and made several pencil sketches and um, some rough paintings. And the one he came to me with eventually, um, hoping that that's the one I would like, was this particular one. And he painted it um, coincidentally from the exact location as to where the visitor centre is today. As that slide illustrates manifestly, uh, the choice of location was not without controversy. There were two distinct camps endeavouring to secure the construction of a centre on their preferred site. Uh, the fact that the current location was outside the area, or outside the core area, and incorporated the river, was really big. The River Boyne, the M1 of its day, and this eventually swayed the day. So after bitter controversy um, and an overt battle across the airwaves um, in the printed media uh, and with many protests, with an oral hearing coming to pass, eventually uh, the decision was made to build um, what you see the beginnings of there. Now I see I chose the bridge as a slide because not alone just to show you the extent of the millions that were spent on the centre, but also to highlight the fact that there was quite a bit of bridge building to be done and carried out following the construction of the centre itself. Um, there was an open wound and we had to set about trying to heal the open wound. Um, from the outset, we were aware of the importance of Brunabonia as a tourist destination um, and the implicit financial spin-off. When the visitor centre was being built, public meetings were held and banking officials, lending officials were invited along to meetings and experts on enterprise were also invited along to sit around the same table to have a chat with locals as to what um, potential business there would be down the line for them on the opening of the centre. And indeed, the local economy at the time did need 
um, an injection of something. Now, the centre itself employs 30 people, 30 full-time jobs, a lot in the age we live in, in these difficult financial times. Now, that's not to mention all the spin-offs to B&Bs, hotels, craft shops, pubs, etc. And being an old Onoiga member, at the time my baby was try make sure and erect a hostel in close proximity to the centre to look after the, bag, uh, the back backpacker. And uh, that hostel does exist now today. A good few years on, mind you, but nonetheless it's there. Uh, some of the, we were very anxious to uh, spread the load, as they say, uh, spread the benefit of all these visitors coming to Newgrange and Nauth as best we could within the local area. And uh, we started off fairly small and started spreading out. Uh, the, one of the first things we did was we uh, set a special rate of admission for people who stayed in local B&Bs. And we would give their guests a chance to have a book booked access, which wasn't always possible for other people. We provided an exhibition space for local places of interest, like the Ledwich Museum and the Boyne Curragh Centre, Millmount Museum. And then working very closely with Falsha Ireland, we have really tried in the last four or five years to keep every visitor who comes to see Newgrange or Nauth in the Boyne Valley. And we, found, we have found, uh, got together with a large network of, of people who work in tourism in the Boyne Valley. But because, as Tomás has mentioned earlier, uh, there had been such divisions before the visiting of the centre, it was very much the Office of Public Works policy at the time and intention to include the local community as much as possible in whatever we were doing at Bruna Bonia. And the first person who came knocking on the door was Tomás Hushtheen. I, I would have had a preference for a classroom in the centre if I had my way <laughs> at the time. didn't happen, but maybe in the future. Yeah, looking to the young, uh, the future custodians of Brunabonia, I approached Claire um, with a tale of woe. Um, I'm teaching principal in a very small school. There were 35 pupils there when I started. There are 75 there now. Um, but we had no hall, no facility for which to stage a play. So I approached Claire and asked if it would be possible, at all possible, to stage our play in the centre, in the visitor centre. And there was a can-do attitude straight away and a positive response. And we did transform the tea rooms into a theatre. Came in at five o'clock, erected a stage, installed sound equipment and lighting, uh, 300 grannies and uncles and aunts and mams and dads packed the tea rooms and a great time was had by all. Um, so the downstairs of the visitor centre was converted into a theatre and by 10.30 that night, well, maybe 11 was it? Uh, uh, <laughs> it was back and ready for business for the following day again. And there was a lot of cooperation would have had to have happened for this to take place. From the erection of the stage um, to lots of chats between myself and Claire just to see how things would work out. Um, but Claire and some of her co-workers were there with us right up until 11 o'clock that evening. And this has become now an annual event, a fixture. Um, Loretto showed a slide there earlier of a, a simulated dig. Well, we went for the real thing. Um, and again, looking to the young, with an educator or a pedagogue's eye. Geraldine Stout and John O'Brien had promised us that they could organise for the children to partake in some excavation work near Nauth. And it turned out to be an educational experience second to none. The children there, you see, they were dusting away at skeletal remains and we were digging with trowels and working with riddles and sieves and the hands-on type learning uh, could not be replicated in the classroom, could never be. But uh, and we, we did make actually some fines on the day, 
But the message for the children, this is a special place. We are privileged to live here. We are the local custodians. Uh, we also had a photographic competition. Uh, it was a, I'm not sure exactly where the idea emanated from, but it was a very simple idea with broad participation. And the children, incidentally, took a closer look at their environs. Um, that's, do you want to move on there? that's the Mead County manager there presenting the prizes to some of the lucky winners. Now, moving up the age groups, looking to secondary school, leaving certs. The monuments of which we speak are on the Leaving Cert syllabus, the History of Art section. Um, and local children are at a great advantage in that um, they can explore the monuments through art and exhibit their work publicly in the centre. Again, the educator and the manager, as a good neighbour, is responding to requests from local schools and reaching out, knowing that the standard of the work is superior when the children are given a purpose, that is, they can exhibit their work. The, win the annual draw for places at the winter solstice has become almost as big an event as the winter solstice itself. And uh, when we moved to the lottery system, um, we decided, the, we, we, the Office of Public Works decided that if whoever was, was to come to for the solstice, it was the children from the local schools who were going to pick the winners. And last year we had over 30,000 applications and uh, we had people coming from all over the world. But it's a big day out for not just Tomasa School, but for our local school in Slane and in um, Donore. Yeah, it's a fixture on the calendar. And the children really enjoy the solstice draw. Um, the word lottery causes anticipation in itself and a little bit of effervescent behaviour on the part of the children. Um, there, there's anticipation and the wondering what part of the world will the lucky winner hail from and maybe if somebody local might draw a ticket. And the children are treated royally on the day. Uh, four children in my class, I remember the first time we did it, uh, they ended up on the front page of the Saturday edition of the Irish Times, which was big news for our area. And I think um, one other year, a number of them appeared on the 9 o'clock news. Again, massive, big, big news. Um, but besides being a, a very good geography lesson and all that, it's really a great fun day. It's not just the young people. I'm going to skip through these now because Colm will drag us off the stage if I don't. <laughs> Um, we have senior citizens' Christmas parties every year. We have our buses at Brunabonia, which carry our, our visitors from the visitor centre to the monuments. And we use those buses to collect people and, probably more importantly, leave them home after a few drinks after the Christmas party. We have an annual shindig in the centre where our local people, they're all local people, come in and dance the afternoon away around St. Patrick's weekend. We feel a very close association with St. Patrick. I know Loretta's claiming him for Tara, but we claim him in Slane as well. And um, it's uh, a great afternoon for us, but it's also a great afternoon for our visitors. We um, have run lectures and talks in the centre, and I have to take just one second to thank every archaeologist or historian who has ever come down to either Brunabonia or Tara and done one of our lectures. I have n people have never hesitated when asked but to come along. And uh, that was a poster we made from Wirish's lecture. Because of the planting in the centre, uh, it was all planted with plants that were, uh, would have grown in the Neolithic. We can organise early morning nature rambles. We don't even give them the term walk. We go so slowly. We have wildflower walks on Sunday afternoons in the summer. And every year uh, we have a, a huge um, participation by local craft workers at the centre. We're in our 11th year now, where the problem was how do you get the visitors to come out to go to local craft workers? And instead of getting the visitors to go out, we got the craft workers to come in. So every year for July and August, visitors to Brunabonia can meet and see local craft workers in action. So just slide through that. We also have art exhibitions. I thought when the first few art exhibitions were over that it would dry up, but I had no idea of the extent of the inspiration that those monuments still provide for artists and what the different types of art. 
I give you to our football correspondent now. Just yeah. before the football, I, ha I can't let the occasion pass without um, thanking Claire for the work that was done, inviting guest speakers down to give lectures in Brunabonia. It was I, I, I was chairperson of the local Brunabonia Historical Society, and it, that's what got us started. Um, and we were drawing big names. We were definitely boxing well above our weight. Uh, the Brunabonia football team, yeah. Yeah. Claire, keep me on cue here. Yeah. Uh, it's the under-14 team you see there, and the name of the team is the Brunabonia football team. And the team comprises footballers from the north side and the south side of the river. So it's a very uh, appropriate slide to, to sort of bring us towards a conclusion. Um, you, they were presented with the Summer League trophy there and their division winners trophy there. And the trophies were presented by another mead footballer, um, I see there was a mead footballer, Loretto had a mead footballer mentioned earlier. Uh, we had the guy who scored the try for mead to beat Louth in the Leinster <laughs> Championship. Um, that still irks with me, being a Louth man. Last year we had a Boyne Valley Walking Festival. This was a completely new departure for us because the idea came not from any of us within the centre but came from outside and uh, a series of walks through the World Heritage Site were organised and the people who organised the walks got permission from the landowners to go across their land and it provided an opportunity to approach the monuments from a completely new angle. And they, uh, those walks are continuing always, every Saturday, I see them walking through. Final slide. Tomas. That's a brusty girl, Tomas. <laughs> <laughs> the ingredients uh, for a multi-million centre becoming an integral part of community, healing wounds of controversy as they go, um, and bringing children and adults alike to an understanding of Brunabonia, where we came from, caves of yesteryear to passage graves of today. Well, what are the ingredients? What I, this is my personal opinion. Uh, the ingredients are, firstly, vision and having the vision to look to all age groups. Being responsive, being responsive in a creative way to the needs of a community. Having a can-do attitude, I mentioned that already. And having a belief in the organic, and by that I mean being open to change. Having a caring eye and a kind heart and being a practical, reflective practitioner. So our inobtrusive centre is now part of the seamless garment of community, presenting and interpreting the passage graves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.